Right, so I'm back again to answer your technical problems, questions or queries here in the GCN Tech Clinic. Constantin wants to know brake pads. I know that carbon rims can wear out the non-carbon specific brake pads fast, but would it work the other way around? Is it safe to train on alloy wheels with carbon specific brake pads? Right, okay, well let's just clarify this for everyone out there. Uh, brake pads do come in different compounds, uh, as well as for rim type, also weather types too. But let's stick with those carbon specific pads. So they work excellent on carbon rims because generally they've got a harder compound, so they work better because generally you're gonna generate more heat with a carbon rim. One thing to consider is if you start to use them on an alloy rim, you're not gonna get as good braking. Plus, when you're braking, you're actually gonna pick up tiny little shards of aluminium into those pads. Then, if you go back to using your carbon wheels, those tiny little aluminium shards can start wearing away at your brake surface. You might not notice it immediately, but it will happen over time. So basically, for the small cost of a new set of brake pads, I would really just use some special pads for the job. Here's a question from Rob Jones who asks, Hi John, currently I have 52 to 36 with an 1128 cassette. I've got sportives coming up with some steep climbs, done them before on a full compact 50 to 34. Could he fit a 34 front ring instead of the 36 or is it better to change the cassette? and he's got DI2. Uh, the good news is, Rob, is that I've tried this out in the workshop earlier on, so you can thank me in the comments. In seriousness, uh, yes, you can do it. So you can have a 52 or a 50 down to a 34. The shifting, it's not gonna be brilliant, to be perfectly honest with you, but it is possible, and especially as, like you say, you've got a DI2 front derailleur on there. Uh, Years ago, when I used to play around sometimes trying to fit some of those oval tile type chain rings I was once given, I ended up clamping and crushing so many front derailleur cables through playing around, just moving the front mech up and down, trying to get it spot on. In the end, I gave up. But good news is you've got that DI2 mech. So you can play around moving up and down that front mech to get the perfect or as close to perfect shifting as possible. One thing though to consider is if you are using a small chain ring and one of the smallest sprockets at the back, so an 11 or a 12, the chain may be a little bit long. So you don't really want that because it's gonna rub and it's not really gonna be giving you optimal performance anyway. So avoid that combination of gearing. Okay, next up is a question from Toasty Bear. Uh, with regards to the DI2 1011 speed shifter compatibility question, uh, I can understand that you would need a new derailleur to go to 11 speed, probably a longer cage, but the shifters are effectively just buttons. And if they have no programming in, does that not mean you can just get a new rear mech but keep the levers? Totally correct. Uh, other than on the old uh, Shimano 7970, I think it was, group set. That was the first edition of Durace uh, DI2. That used a five wire signal. So that had five little cables inside of that one big cable. Everything else since has been using a different system. So it's totally compatible with one another. And yep, you're dead right there. I at home actually use an 11 speed 9150 Durace Di2 rear derailleur, and that's paired up to some old Tegra 6770 10-speed shifters, and it works absolutely fine. So yeah, you can mix and match. There are some compatibility issues with 11-speed uh, rear derailleurs and 10-speed front, they don't work. So if you are gonna start changing things around, just bear in mind that you will end up basically having to go to 11-speed front derailleur as well. Next up is Chris Poiser. Hi guys, great show as always. Uh, when buying a new stem for a winter stroke gravel bike, how do I work out what degree of drop to get to replicate the position on my summer bike? Hi Chris, that's a really great question uh, because generally your winter bike or your gravel bike is gonna have a slightly more relaxed position than that summer bike, which has probably got an aggressive race position. So what are you gonna do? Well, I'm not a trigonometry genius, I'm not a genius at all in fact, but there is a website which I've used in the past to actually help with stem angles and also lengths to provide that reach. So the link to it is on screen right now and also in the description down below. So have a little look around with that and a little play around and you should be able to try and replicate that position. So next up we've got a question from Nooksack who asks, will we using a new chain on an old worn cassette ruin the chain? They want to set up an old wheel as a trainer wheel, but don't want to ruin their chain. 
Uh, it's a good idea actually to have a different wheel for your trainer. That way you can actually use one of those special turbo trainer tires on there. Uh, in the past, I actually bought kind of a trekking rim or a uh, hybrid type rim, so it's a little bit wider to fit that tire on because sometimes they can be a bit of a pain to get on. Um, now, basically, yes, if you use a new chain on an old cassette, it's not gonna work well, and it is gonna wear out that chain prematurely. So what I'd advise, basically, is to get yourself uh, a low-end cassette from the same manufacturer so you just use that on that indoor bike. So you're gonna keep those crisp gear shifts and basically it doesn't matter that it's a lower end component because you're not gonna be using it outdoors so there's nothing to be dragging up a hill. Right, next up, Kristen wants to know, could I fit Shimano 105 brakes with Sora shifters? Or is there actually a difference in the pull in the lever? Um, that's an interesting one. Uh, so some manufacturers, they use a different amount of pull than the other ones. In fact, they all do, otherwise everyone could just mix and match. So in essence, your Shimano levers will work with a different Shimano caliper. Now they may well pull a little bit different on the, the amount of cable that's actually coming through the outer cable and to the caliper itself, but it's not gonna to be totally incompatible and the difference is gonna be pretty small. So by and large, it's good to go. What you don't want to do though is start mixing SRAM calipers with Shimano levers or Campagnolo calipers with SRAM levers and vice versa, all those things. That's not gonna give you great braking. So try and stick to just that one manufacturer. You'll be okay. Another tire question. I get plagued with tire questions for some reason. Now, Humberto Leandro wants to know, when the pros have a puncture on their tubular tires, are they thrown away after one puncture or is it possible to fix and use them again? Right, it's an interesting one. Um, generally, they just throw them away. The reason being is that the sponsor provides enough so they can just keep using new ones. Uh, it's not particularly good for the environment possibly, but I guess that the team are just thinking about race wins and results. Now it is possible to patch them up and I reckon years gone by, team would get them and then patch them up and then give them to a rider and they could use them in training. However, these days most pros don't train on tubular tires because clincher tires have come on so much. Now, like I just said, it is possible to repair them. It's not particularly easy or uh, time effective though because you're gonna have to peel back the base tear of that tubular tire, unpick the stitching of the carcass of the tire, repair the inner tube, sew it all back together and then relay that base tape. Not the sort of thing you really want to do at the side of the road, I'm sure you agree. As he threlful wants to know, hi John, really big fan of the show. That's kind of you. Uh, I was wondering if there are any pros or cons to multi-shifting with DI2, thanks. Uh, hi Asi, well, I'm a big fan of Shimano's DI2, right back since I saw prototypes of it in 2007. And the DI2 multi-shift function, basically that means that you can press one of the shift buttons and in doing so, have multiple gear shifts at once. Uh, now I can't really actually think of any massive pros for it because it's not often you're gonna to wanna to change so many gears all at one time. Uh, the only sort of instance I could think about it would be if you were literally riding on a roller coaster. So down and then up really, really steep and then suddenly down really, really steep. So to go all the way back into a higher gear. Um, so it's not really any pros out there for it. Uh, cons, I can think of a couple. One would be that if you leave your finger too long on the button, you could shift more gears than what you wanted. So leaving you in not the ideal gear at the time. Uh, but you know, it's easy enough to try around. So plug your bike into the YouTube software and have a play around. If you don't like it, you can just go back to the standard shifting. Okay, next up, Hamish McDonald. He's got some new wheels and basically rode them for the first time in heavy rain and noticed they were holding water. Is it common? Is there anything to be concerned about? I'll tell you what, Hamish, those new wheels of yours getting treated to heavy rain on their first outing, it's not very kind of you. Uh, but however, most deep section wheels, they do tend to gather a little bit of water in them. Um, it does disappear though. I don't know where. You could put the bike on top of some newspaper to actually you know, put your mind at rest to make sure that the water does leave. Some rims do actually have little drainage holes. So have a look around and you may find them. Now, if you've got clincher tires and you're still really concerned about getting that water out, just take off the tires, remove the rim tape and pour it out. Or you could put the bike near a radiator. That could absorb it. Okay, Gary Street wants to know, John, please help. I have a 2017 Specialized Roubaix with a slipping seat post. 
Uh, he's removed it, cleaned it, and reapplied the grip compound without success. Uh, he doesn't want to over torque the bolts as this is the Roubaix frame where the seat clamp is mounted lower to give more compliance. Any ideas? Um, all right, first up, great that you're using both that grip compound as well as a torque wrench because quite a few people out there don't and I can't emphasize how important it is to do that. Now, if possible, try and actually measure with some calipers the exact diameter of both the seat post as well as the frame. They do go in 0.2 millimeter increments. And it wouldn't be the first time that I've known someone to have the wrong size seat post in their frame. And 0.2 millimeters can actually make a huge difference in that interface. So actually check that out. Uh, something else you could try, it's a bit of a hack or is it a bodge? I've seen it done in the past before, even on a professional's bike, was a bit of aluminum drinks can. They carefully cut it and they wrapped it around the seat post, put it in, did up the seat clamp bolt and everything was good. Bit of a hack, bit of a bodge. Uh, final resort, take it down to your local shop and get them to check it out as there possibly could be something actually with the frame that's causing this issue. Final question this week is from Max Grass who asks, do pros use sealant in their tubular tires? And also he wants to know, are any pros using a tubular setup or is it all tubular? Right, okay, so just to recap to everyone, uh, you can actually put a sealant into an inner tube, a tire or a tubular tire. And the idea behind that is if you do puncture, the sealant actually forms a seal in the hole. So you're not gonna lose any tire pressure or a very small amount. As for pros using it, not as far as I'm aware. The reason being they're gonna start adding rolling resistance to a wheel by adding in that extra weight um, when they don't really need it because generally they have a team car pretty close by they can just radio to and get a spare wheel pretty quick. Now a race where it could be very, very useful is Paris-Roubaix. So in that race, you don't really have a team car that close to you a lot of the time because the race tends to get split over quite a large space of time because of the terrain. So that could be an ideal race actually where a rider could use that in their tubular tire. As for riders actually using tubular setups, not as far as I'm aware. I think a team did use them a few years back. I think there were some Hutchinson tires, not sure. Uh, but I will keep my eyes peeled and I'll let you know if I see any. That is it, we're here at the end of the show. Uh, now do remember to leave your technical questions, queries and problems for me down there in the comments or all over social media using the hashtag AskGCNTech. Now remember as well to like and share this video with your friends, so give it a big thumbs up, tell your mates all about it. If they've got a problem, they can leave it for me down there too. Uh, remember as well to check out the GCN shop at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. You can buy things like this. And also to check out the latest GCN tech show, click just down here.